Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and this is my series of tutorial videos on how to use SPSS to work with data. In this video, I'm going to show you how to conduct and interpret a one-way ANOVA. As always, we'll be using the YouTube Viewing Habit survey that I created, and you can find both a link to the data file and a video tutorial of the data below. A one-way ANOVA is a very useful tool for comparing the average value of a variable across a large number of subgroups. Whereas a t-test is great for comparing across two subgroups, an ANOVA lets you compare across n or as many subgroups as you need. I'm going to show you a one-way ANOVA, which is really the simplest version of that today, and I'll show you two different ways to do it. One that I think is very typical, and one that I think is actually much better to use. In future videos, I'll cover topics like two- and three-way ANOVAs, how to use covariates, how to plot the results, how to do repeated measures and multivariate analysis, but for this one, we're going to keep it simple, and we're going to stick with one-way ANOVA. We're going to start by working with two variables. The first is going to be this variable called minutes watched, which is the number of minutes somebody spent watching YouTube in a given day, but importantly, it's coded as a categorical variable, where one represents zero minutes, two equals one to 30 minutes, and so on. This is gonna be our grouping variable, or what we're using to predict with. And what we'll be using to actually predict is all the way at the bottom, which is right here, this average opinion. It's the average of a number of questions asking people about their attitudes towards YouTube. So first I'm gonna show you the way that I actually don't like to use ANOVA, but it's right here. If you go up to Analyze, Compare Means, One-Way ANOVA. That opens up this window and it'll allow you to conduct an ANOVA analysis and I'll very briefly show you how to do that so you can see, but then I'm gonna switch over to the other way to do it. So if I want to see how the average opinion differs as a function of which response people chose for a minute watched, I would take minute watch, put it in the factor list. That's the one that we're gonna group on. And then I take average opinion and I put it in the dependent list and that will give us our analysis of variance. There's many other options I can select, but again, because I'm gonna be showing you a different approach, I just wanna show you what this looks like, and then I'm gonna show you the better approach to doing this. I can go ahead and click okay, and my output is simply gonna tell me my overall result for the analysis of variance. In this case, I see that the between group comparison has an F statistic of 14.707 with five degrees of freedom, and that is highly statistically significant, well below our cutoff of 0.05, which tells us that at least one group here differs from at least one other group in terms of its average opinion towards YouTube on these various options. The null hypothesis, just to remind you, is that none of the groups differ from each other in terms of the average on that output option. In this case, we can reject that null, and so we say there's a difference. This tool that I showed you could absolutely give you more detail and more specificity of where that difference is, but rather than belabor that, I wanna show you the other approach. The other approach uses a different tool. Under Analyze, General Linear Model Univariate, you can conduct an ANOVA analysis using this much more robust tool called the General Linear Model. To be absolutely clear, the one-way ANOVA can be conducted the way I just showed you using the one-way ANOVA tool. The advantage of the univariate analysis, and I'll open that up right now, is that it can do a whole lot more. So rather than learning how to do a one-way ANOVA in a tool that's highly limited, I'm gonna show you how to do this in a tool that's much more versatile, like one that can use covariates, or one that could do two or three-way ANOVAs, or one that can change the model specificities, or one that could let you plot the data in very interesting ways or one that can even let you include fixed versus random effects, which is a topic for another video. The point is, I'm gonna teach you the robust form of this tool, and you can use it for the simple case, or you can use it for the more complex one. So let's just redo that exact analysis we did a moment ago. In this case, I'm gonna take minute watched, and I'm gonna put it in my fixed factor. For all intents and purposes right now, we're gonna leave our grouping variable in fixed factor. I'm then going to take my outcome variable, which is average opinion, and I'll put that into the dependent variable list. I'm not gonna check any of the other options. I just wanna show you what this looks like. If I go ahead and click OK, I get a bunch of information, including the number of responses in each of these categories. And importantly, I get the same. And the thing I just wanna point out is that if you look at minute watched, which is our independent variable that we're looking at right now, the F statistic is 14.707, and that is exactly the same as we had up here. This is literally the same test. It's just presenting it in a different way. So this is all well and good. And I really wanna just highlight the things you should be paying attention to in this result. The first is whatever your independent variable is, whatever your predictor variable is, will always be named right here. If you have multiple predictor variables, they will all be named there. If you have interactions, they will all be named there. In our case, we only have one variable, so we see it here, minute watch. The things that you really need to care about are the F statistic, the number of degrees of freedom if you're reporting this, and the significance level. So if you were reporting this result, what you would say is the F value and the degrees of freedom are five for our between subject variable and 981 for our error equals 14.707, which corresponds to a p-value less than 0.001. But of course, this doesn't tell us where the differences are. For that, we need a little bit more information. And to get that information, we again go back to analyze, 
general linear model at univariate. And now I'm going to walk you through some of these other options that are available to you. If we click the model option, here it's quite simple. We only have one variable, so there's really not much we can do. But if we had more variables and wanted to limit the number of interactions we have, this is where we can specify that. For now, we don't need to. Under contrast, this is where we can make specific comparisons across groups, but I actually really don't like their tool because they don't allow me to specify specific contrasts that I want to run, like between group two versus group four or something like that. Uh, and so I don't use this at all. In fact, I use a different tool called L matrix within the scripting tool, and I'll show you how to do that in a separate video. Under plots, we can actually plot the results, and I do like to do this quite a bit. In fact, under minute watch, we can take that and move it over to the horizontal axis so that that's going to be on our horizontal axis when it's plotted. We're going to click add to add that plot and note that we can make this much more complex if we have more variables. And you can either have a line or a bar chart. I'll include a bar chart. You could also include error bars, which is quite useful by clicking this option right here. And I'll leave it to 95% confidence intervals. And then I click continue. Under post hoc, we have a litany of really nice ways to do post hoc comparisons. So as a quick reminder, an ANOVA, if you actually do all the pairwise comparisons, is just a bunch of t-tests. So group one versus group two, group one versus group three, and so on. And we can ask for that if we move this over to the side and ask for the LSD or least significant differences comparison. The problem, of course, is that if I do that, I'm failing to correct for multiple comparisons because I'm ostensibly just fishing for differences. And so a much better way to make those comparisons is with something like a Bonferroni corrected comparison, which is going to make those pairwise comparisons for us, but it's going to penalize us for the fact that we don't have an a priori hypothesis and are really just kind of guessing and, and fishing around. It'll take that p-value that's reported and adjusted for the number of tests that are being run. And I'll show you what that looks like. There are many other options here. You can explore those at your leisure. Under EM means, what I like to do is include everything on this table in the display means for. What this is going to do in this case is just show us the means for our different levels of this variable. But again, if we have multiple variables, what it can do is show us the cross tabs of all the different information conditional on different groupings. That's really powerful and useful. For now, we're just going to see the one way means. I'll click continue. There's some other options within save. So for instance, you could have it save things like predicted values and residuals. I don't find that all that useful too often, so I'm not going to do that here. And lastly, under options, there are actually many things you could look for. So for instance, having an estimate of the effect size can be quite useful. And I will in fact select that here. You can ask for a whole bunch of other things, including uh, descriptive statistics, but we will get most of that from the EN means. You could ask for a homogeneity test, which is really going to be useful for doing repeated measure analysis. You can ask for residual plots if that's important to you and so on. So there's a lot more that you can get here than that simple tool. We're going to stick with just those estimated effect sizes. I'm going to hit continue and now I'll hit OK and you'll see that we get a whole lot more information. The first thing we see is just the same. In fact, this is just the number of respondents in each of these categories. Here's our same test of between subject effects. So we see that minute watch variable has the same number of degrees of freedom, the same F value, the same significance level, but now we actually also get the estimate of an effect size, which for an F test like this is a partial eta squared. And that can be quite useful if you're trying to compare effect sizes across different analyses. We then get our estimated marginal means. That's our grand mean. So the mean for all of these individuals across all these groups is a 5.59 on a seven point scale. And then we see down here, these are our averages by group. So we see that those folks who selected zero, their average opinion of YouTube was a 4.5 on the seven point scale or this average of seven point scales. It was a 5.46 for people who selected this option and so on. For each of those estimates, we have the standard error as well as the 95% confidence interval. And most critically down here, we have our Bonferroni corrected comparisons. The way to read this table is that this is every possible pairwise comparison that can be made between these six groups. So if you want to know how many there are, it's actually just six choose two, which is 15. This table will report that result twice because it reports both, let's say zero minutes versus one in 30 and one in 30 versus zero minutes. That's the exact same test reported twice. So even though there's 30 rows to this table, there's actually only 15 tests. So that Bonferroni correction is going to correct for the fact that we had 15 chances to find a significant result, and we should penalize ourselves for that. Practically, the way that it's going to do that is it's going to take these p-values right here and multiply all of them by 15. So what you see here are already the Bonferroni corrected comparisons. But getting back to what these actually are, here's zero minutes versus one in 30. The mean difference between the average responses across these two groups is 0.9. And those are statistically significant differences. And again, that is after we correct for multiple comparisons using a Bonferroni correction. Zero versus 31, also significant. Zero versus 61 to 120, also significant. You get the idea. That's not to say that everything is going to be significant. For instance, here are 31 minutes versus 61 minutes. 
that is not significant. That's capped at one because you can't have a p-value greater than one. The Bonformity correction is what resulted in that. So if we just look at what those values are, 31 versus 61, we see that a mean of 5.81 and a mean of 5.98 cannot be distinguished from one another. We can't reject the null that those two are the same. And then the last thing we have down here is actually our graph. This is a nice quick visual way to see what our mean differences are. We clearly see that people who don't watch YouTube have a less favorable opinion of it as compared to people who watch it more. It does seem like there's a plateau though. As you start to increase up to 30 to 60 minutes a day, that doesn't seem like it's all that different from watching more than 180 minutes a day. And in large ways that is borne out by these comparisons. So that's a lot to take in for a one-way analysis of variance, especially using this new tool called a general linear model. This is the point of the video where actually I think it's worthwhile for you to pause the video and try this yourself. In particular, why don't you go ahead and try and use this variable modality one? This is a question that people responded indicating which modality they were most likely to use when watching YouTube. And their response options were computer, tablet, smartphone, TV, other, and none. And you can stick with this output of average opinion to see if that differs as a function of what modality people use. So again, take a moment, pause the video and give it a try and I'll show you how it works when you're done. All right, hopefully you've given that a go and I'll give it a go as well. So under Analyze, General Linear Model, Univariate, I'll hit Reset just so we can do this from scratch. I'm gonna use Modality 1 as my fixed factor, that's my grouping factor. I'm gonna stick with Average Opinion as a dependent variable. Under Plots, I'm gonna put this over into Horizontal Axis. I'm gonna click Add, and I like my bar charts with error bars. Under Post Hoc, I'm gonna move this over and I'm gonna ask for the Bonferroni Corrected Comparisons. Under EM means, I'm going to take all of this and move it over and ask for the means. And under options, I'm going to ask for the estimated effect sizes because I think those are quite useful to have as well. I'll click OK and let's see what our result looks like. So the first thing to notice is that our modality one variable reported right here has a result that is statistically significant. It is below our threshold of 0.05, which means we can reject the null hypothesis that the mean of this opinion question is the same across all five of our groupings, which are described right up here. If we scroll down, we see that these are the average responses and that's how they differ. But most importantly, when we look at our Bonferroni corrected comparisons, we actually see there's not a whole lot going on. Because once we make all of these five choose two comparisons or 10 comparisons in total, it turns out we cannot, after correcting for multiple comparisons, reject any of these null hypotheses that the pairwise comparisons are identical. So despite the fact that our overall analysis came back statistically significant, it seems like we have insufficient differentiation across these variables, perhaps insufficient data, to actually conclude that they differ in any meaningful way. Lastly, we can take a look at our plots, and we see that even though there is a mean difference for other, if you recall, there are only a few responses there. There's only six of them. And so our 95% confidence interval on that estimate is huge, making any differences we observe not sufficiently statistically significant. So again, one way and over, super useful tool for making comparisons across multiple groups on a single average. That's it for this video. I hope you found this useful, and if you have any questions, please comment below, and I'll be sure to reply as quickly as I can. Aside from these tutorials, I'm on a mission to equip everyone with the information they need to thrive in our data-rich world. If you'd like to learn not just the mechanics of analysis, which these video tutorials focus on, but also learn the intuition behind the analysis you're performing, I strongly suggest you check out the other intuition-focused videos on this channel where I take the jargon out of statistics and data science and help you build a deep, intuitive understanding behind all the analysis that you're performing. I'll put a link below to a playlist of the videos that focus on just this. Finally, please take a moment to like the video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content that I put out. Thanks for watching.